Thank you. So now we move on to uh, the safe opening of uh, Leisure Green Lanes. This has been an incredible panel to stitch together. Um, so let's welcome Ang Chu Pin, Senior Director, Government and Corporate Affairs, Managing Director, Asia Expedia Group. We have Campbell Wilson, the CEO of Scoot. We have Hugh Mason, CEO and founder of TrustScan. And we have Ross Beach, CEO and co-founder of WeGo. So, right. So guys, how are we going to open the ledger? You need to sit there because that's my seat. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm so bossy, right? You have to, you know, you have to. All right, so let's let's start off um, with uh, Ross. And you're gonna set the stage first, and then we're gonna go into sure. the session. Okay. okay. Firstly, right, it's Ross. so great to be here. Actually, doing a uh, a conference in person again. Thank yeah. you, Sue, for figuring out this. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna set sort of set the scene. I've got a whole bunch of data-rich slides, so buckle up. We've only got a few minutes. So, <laughs> so firstly, quick run through of what's happening in uh, with COVID uh, country by country. This is based on a, a methodology the EU's put together for um, sort of figuring out, so it's like a traffic light system, green, orange, red, you know, how, how safe a country is or isn't. It's based on three factors, and I've got Singapore here as, a, as an example. So um, a country is deemed safe if you've got less than 25 new cases per day per million, and your test positivity is under 3%, and the government is testing um, above 250 uh, per day, which works out to a, you know, roughly, um, uh, it's about 1% a month, 1% a month. That, that, that's sort of like the benchmark for you know, doing enough to be surveilling the population and keeping things under control. So as of, uh, as of today, um, these are the, the, the countries that are deemed safe. Um, much shorter list this week than two weeks ago. Most of Europe was on the list two weeks ago. If you break it down by region, the Americas, we've only got two candidates, Uruguay and Cuba. Um, Canada's just outside, um, close. To, um, rest of the region um, in a bit of trouble. Uh, Europe, basically half the countries of the EU are no longer meeting the EU test for safety. Um, that's sort of a, a relatively recent development. And it, it's interesting how fast this is changing. So we go, we've actually sort of um, got this updating every day just so we can keep a, keep a handle on it. Um, Middle East, where we spend a lot of time focusing. So Saudi's actually in a pretty good place now. And um, UAE, while strictly don't not not meeting the, the EU's criteria, is actually testing at you know, um, record levels across the planet. They're actually doing about 1% of the population um, every day. Um, so they're finding a lot more positives. Um, but basically, the, the, the two biggest countries in the GCC more or less under control. Africa, um, unfortunately, Whoa. nobody's you know, hitting the criteria. Um, and Asia Pacific is actually the, the region doing the best. So as per the EU criteria, you've got um, You've got uh, five countries. I would add to this um, Taiwan, uh, Thailand, Japan, who, who, based on this criteria, they're not doing enough testing, but they do have other methods for maintaining um, public health, uh, um, uh, like uh, enough tests across the population. And I would also add um, China and Vietnam, who are lit off this list for the reason that they're not sharing enough test data to run this, this simple, um, simple uh, formula. Um, but by all measures, you know, life is, is more or less returning to normal. So moving on, so tracking the travel recovery. So uh, you know, look at you know, where, where travel is recovering and where it isn't. So, and this is all based on WeGo internal data. So it's the uh, searches in green, uh, bookings in, in orange. So Asia Pacific is a bit of a paradox, right? So across the region, and, and this is all flight data. With, this is a cross-border session, right? So focusing on flights. Asia Pacific as a region is doing best in terms of getting COVID under control. With a couple of you know, big exceptions, you know, the region is doing um, a good job. However, the region as a, as a whole is doing the worst in terms of actually figuring out how to get travel restarted, cross-border travel. So this is a blend of domestic and um, international, and it sort of reflects our weighting of APAC markets, but you know, less than 15%. You know, of travel that was taking place this time last year is now happening. So okay. I, th I think governments in this part of the world have some work to do to figure this out. Um, India is doing relatively better. So um, it's up at about 22%. But if you look at the search volumes, we're about half where we were this time last year. Um, Middle East uh, is up above about a quarter, which is great for us. Um, that big spike, this is Saudi Arabia a couple of weeks ago 
announcing uh, a partial opening of cross-border traffic, partial, but you can sort of see what a big, big spike that, that drove. So that there's, there's a lot of latent demand out there. Um, Europe is in a much better, much better place. They're still around you know, 30, 40% where they were this time last year by our, by our, our data. Um, coming back a bit. And sort of lastly, in terms of demand, we find travel app downloads across the travel category is a pretty good proxy for where bookings are going to be a couple months from now. And the bright spot for Asia, so you can see you know, last week we're at roughly 60% um, or minus 38% of where we were this week last year. So there's a lot of people across Asia Pacific beginning to download travel apps again and they're beginning yeah. to look. So there's a, there's a positive indicator that there's demand there if um, us as an industry and our governments can figure out how to reopen again. Um, and then lastly, just wanted to share a couple of the different approaches, um, different, different, different bodies are advocating for how to reopen. So the EU approach firstly, um, it's a risk calibrated approach to travel restrictions generally. Um, so rather than sort of hard and fast blanket rules, um, it's it, it, uh, different travelers from different countries are treated based on how risky they are um, the EU is trying really hard to avoid reintroducing internal borders. Um, and effectively, the external borders are open to travelers from safe countries, as per that criteria and, and some other you know, interpretation of it, without quarantine and without additional testing. So that, that lack of quarantine is critical. You know, if you put the quarantines in place, you kill the demand. Um, the Dubai approach, they've been doing this since about July, I think. So all visitors, you know, Dubai is effectively open already. All visitors must get a negative PCR test um, less than 96 hours before departure. They have to show the test result at check-in. And then on arrival, selected um, travelers are retested. And if, um, if, if that's you, that you have to go to your hotel, basically stay there until um, the positive result, uh, the negative result comes out. And um, there's a, that's off the bottom of the screen, but there's a, there's a mandatory tracing app, similar to the one that you all had to install to get into this event today. Okay. Um, so Ross, I think what we'll do is we'll pass to Chupin now because you, we're going to pass the baton to, to sure, Chupin sure, sure. and talk about how you know you're thinking about it and you know in your conversations with governments and how uh, governments are thinking about getting travel restarted. Chupin, thank you, Susan, and thank you, Ross, for painting the picture uh, of where we are at now. Now it's important to restart travel in and out of Singapore, and um, you know let's look at the numbers. It's tourism accounts for 11 percent of Singapore's GDP and 14% of employment. And Ross data also shows that it is high time for us to restart travel. Thus far, Asian leaders have taken a very cautious approach towards restarting travel, and it's reflected in a very generally low infection and mortality rates in Asia from COVID-19. However, they may come at a tipping point where too much of a good thing then you know, hurts us. And in my many conversations with government leaders, both um, in Expedia capacity as well as uh, on behalf of the uh, Asia Travel Tech Industry Association, they've summarized a few key points, which is why they're reticent towards reopening. One, the uncertainty trajectory of the virus. Two, there is no international protocol uh, that exists. And this is very reminiscent of the post 9-11 world where countries could not agree on how to do this. There's a chicken and egg dilemma because countries want to see a tried and tested solution before they embark on it, but the private sector will not be able to do so unless governments say we will implement the solution. Fourth, and this is the key one, there's a volunteer's dilemma. Any government that tries to reopen first in a pilot will undertake all the risks, but the benefits for, are for all countries, and therefore it is politically unpalatable for them to do so. Now, if everyone thought like this, then we would be stuck in this conundrum. And this is where I think Singapore can play a key role. In demonstrating to the world how we can reopen travel in a safe way, even in the midst of a pandemic. Now, our business and green lanes of China, I think, are a good start, but the numbers are far too small and too onerous for leisure travel. The domestic staycation efforts, like the Singapore Rediscover vouchers, are great, but they really only make a small impact. And to give you a sense, if we doubled our staycation numbers in Singapore from last year, that would only raise our hotel occupancy rates by 8%. So Singapore really needs to take a very rational approach towards risk taking. To open up green lanes and travel bubbles, we have to start bilaterally with countries 
And we have to overcome the crisis of confidence in being able to enforce a very rigorous testing methodology and make sure you know, authenticity isn't in question. We can be creative. We can be working on bubbles within a bubble. And we're very happy to, uh, to announce that Expedia is working with a consortium of partners to make this happen. We have in-principle approval from the Maldivian government, and we are close and eagerly awaiting approval from the Singapore government. The idea for this Singapore Maldives bubble is not, it, it's not that it will be a magic elixir for all the problems that we have, economic woes, but as a demonstrator of how we can restart travel in a pandemic and to kickstart our economic engine again. And the idea is after Maldives, let's look at other important source countries for Singapore, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, et cetera. A precursor is that we need some level of uh, risk taking, but it's not like we've not seen such episodes before in our 55 years of nation building. When we were a young nation, we had to choose between schools and airports. We chose airports and ports because we wanted to create jobs. We had to choose between English versus other native languages when we risk alienating our ASEAN neighbors. We had to choose between a non-aligned movement or with the Western world. And we had to acquire land forcefully in order for economic activity to resume. And today we are faced with the same existential crisis. Um, the difference is maybe we're not as hungry as before, but not yet. Very soon we will be. And it's better for us to face this crisis now and head on early and to make a choice there is a Chinese saying that goes, he who, locks, he who locks the door needs to unlock it. And the government is the one that closed the borders, or the governments are the ones that close the border. They need to reopen it for us. And we just need the government's blessing to make this happen. The private sector will drive it. I want to end with a quote from House of Cards, um, <laughs> Frank Underwood. If you don't like how the table is set, turn the table around. I think with creativity, gut, and gumption, we can overcome this problem and show the world overthrow the assumption that tra travel cannot happen in a pandemic world. Thank so you. Thank you, you Jupin. Thank you. And over to you, uh, Campbell. Yeah, thank you. Look, I think we all acknowledge that governments, as difficult a job as we have had in the travel industry, governments have had twice as difficult a job, if not more. And I think we need to acknowledge the effort that they've gone to and also the effort that they've gone to on behalf of our industry, uh, especially in the, in the case of Singapore with the opening of green lanes, the, the relaxation on uh, essential business travel, uh, the unilateral opening to four countries um, around the region. But as Chupin said, the, the volume that this will generate is not enough, especially until and unless there is reciprocation from Australia, New Zealand, Brunei, Vietnam, and, and whoever else is open next. Uh, and the government still has their hands full, so it really falls to industry, I think, to assist them with a the solution. Uh, and, and again, to, to follow Chupin, a few of us have got together to try and present a solution to government so that it's easier for them to trial. In, in this particular case, it's with the Maldives, but the Maldives is but one example. Um, it, it is geographically contained, it, it is relatively um, easy to manage, but there are learnings we can draw from this, whether it be from the, the management practices on board the aircraft, the management practices in the airport, uh, the, the practices in transfer on des destination at the hotels, and, and the, the technology that can string this all together to give people trust. Um, so it's really important for industry to take the baton and, and give government a solution because, frankly, the governments don't have the time to do it. Airlines obviously play a part in this because you know, destination, hotel, attraction, they're the organs. The, the airline is the artery. And without the artery, the, obviously the blood doesn't flow. There's also a, a selfish perspective to us too. Even in the case of Maldives, you know, whilst we might want to start off with a Singapore resident travel bubble to Maldives and back, Maldives, in the long term, is really critical to build your frequency from China, build your frequency from Japan, from Taiwan, from Korea. And, and it is that hub nature of travel which really has powered the, the success we've seen over the pre-COVID year. So this is important to us all. So it, it, the consortium that we've put together uh, includes hoteliers, includes airlines, includes platforms, includes technology parties. And, and let's start with people booking on prescribed airline to Maldives, socially segregated on board the aircraft as required by regulation, dealt with by PPE wearing, wearing people on arrival in the Maldives, channeled through a particular part of, of the airport such that they don't interact with others, onto ferry transfer or, or plane transfer that is only people from that flight, going to a resort where people are 
tested regularly, where the transfer employees are, are also resident, so there's not community contamination, and then coming back uh, through a similar platform. It starts people going. It gets people's confidence in travel. It starts introducing the economic driver of travel and tourism. And so I think this is a good place to start. It's certainly not going to solve the problem, but it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a platform from which we can then build. Okay, thank you, Campbell. And so Hugh is going to come in and talk about the technology that kind of brings it together and then that can build the, the confidence. So Hugh, over to you. For sure. And no, it's very interesting to see the pictures from some of the top-down organizations like IATA. Really, really important to do that. As an entrepreneur and an engineer, I look from the bottom up. What have we got lying around that we can bolt together? How can we solve this? And I've got some bad news in my first slide, and then after that, it's all good news. Okay. <laughs> so in terms of the sort of bad news, um, this is a picture through time of, of the pandemics which have hit the human race since about 1750. I'm afraid that they're not going away. Even if we have a fixed vaccine, even when we fix COVID-19, this will not be the last of these issues that come up. You know, until 9-11, we didn't really implement uh, anti-terrorism measures as thoroughly as we do now. We're going to have to take public health seriously. In terms of what that means practically, on the right-hand side, you can see a little box there, which is from the cruise line industry. Um, a group of experts there has put forward 74 different recommendations for what has to change about the, tr about the cruise industry very complex new protocols. So that's the bad news. The paradigm shift is we've got to take public health um, seriously. The positive news is that we have all of the technologies lying around, I believe, to solve this now. And actually, I've seen amongst the many startups that I've invested in that actually technology adoption has been accelerated by a lot of this change, as we were hearing earlier. At the bottom of this slide is a picture of a digital wallet. Many of us are now familiar with having our credit cards digitized on our phones. Of course, we've got these old paper things, passports. You know, maybe it is time that we started thinking about a digital identity and actually moving that stuff on and integrating it with, with OTAs and all the rest of it. There are all sorts of issues around privacy and, and stuff, but none of it is unsolved, unsolvable, and much of it is already dialogue that's in progress. I think we're all familiar with the kind of customer journey that a passenger would go through on a flight from, from um, imagining the journey through to booking it. We perceive that there's probably an extra step, and I've stuck my company, Truscan, up here, but it could be others as well. I think one of the key things about this is we have to have an open system that's interoperable. When you come to um, make a booking for a flight in future, I think you're going to have to be uh, given a series of recommendations about what you have to do. We're going to have a bilateral world for quite a while now with different rules in different places. So the first question is, what do I need to do to be able to travel? And someone needs to tell you that. You're going to need to get tested for COVID-19 and perhaps in the future other things too. The test technology evolves all the time. That's, and, and actually, it is at the moment not terribly scalable. The PCR tests we hear a lot about aren't terribly scalable, but that's getting better. There are all kinds of practical issues when you start thinking about what actually happens when you come to an airport. For example, if you test people at the airport, that's very convenient because you can control quality. But what happens if you then identify someone who's infected? Do you shut down the whole airport? If you test off-site, can you trust the quality of the testing that's being done by independent clinics and labs? So there's a whole series of issues that need talking through there. And, and then in terms of you know, who checks the credentials of someone while they're going through a journey. But if we've done all that stuff and made it digital and we've built on top of the existing checkpoints that exist in the, the passenger journey, it seems to me that that word seamless we heard from one of our uh, guests earlier yeah. on, that becomes possible. It does become possible to create a seamless journey, perhaps all the way through to checking into a room. So we think that ultimately there are going to be a series of technologies that bolt together three groups of people, folk who are traveling, folk who can give them the credentials to travel, and the authorities who set the rules. And this is my last slide here, which I really wanted to leave you with, was a sense of, I think, the, the stack of technologies that we need. At the very top level of it, we need to understand what the requirements are. Policymakers are going to keep changing their rules in response to local conditions. They must do. They've got to protect public health locally. We have to capture that and give travelers radar for it. We've got to be integrated with all the existing travel infrastructure so that the process is as efficient as possible. Moving down to the middle layer, it's very likely, I think, that we're going to see these digital wallets and certificates being part of our everyday traveling experience. We're going to have to have new kinds of testing facilities, maybe at airports, maybe off-site. 
Maybe that's not such a bad thing. Maybe as we move in more general to personalized predictive health, maybe regular testing is something that we'll get used to anyway. And then finally, at the bottom of the stack of technologies, we actually do need tests for COVID-19, which can be done at scale and faster, and that is coming. Okay, so, so this is the technology with which you intend to wrap this bubble, this, mm. lit, this safe green lane to the Maldives, right, between Singapore and, and, and the Maldives. Any questions, guys? Is this sort of uh, mind-blowing? Or any, any questions from the audience on this? I think you stunned them. <laughs> Where are we now in the, in the, you know, I mean, like, are we ready to go? We went, we've been through all those layers in that picture I showed you, and there's nothing stopping us at any of those layers. It's a matter of bolting the bits together. And as Chu Pin said, that's really about having a green light from government. If we can get that, we can start. He who, un he who locked the door needs to unlock it. Okay, so once we unlock the door, then basically, for example, Singapore Airlines or Scoot would then mount a few flights to the Maldives and work with hotel partners to create this sort of safe bubble within the bubble. Of okay. course, it's in our interest to start. And I think, especially with this particular bubble, there's enough pent up demand to be quite confident about the commercial return. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's start. Yeah, and clearly Maldives is already opened anyway, right? They've, they've uh, reopened. And, and the government and the Maldives have indicated that all of what we've communicated here is possible and something they're committing to. Okay, so they could implement whatever is required from the Singapore mm -hmm. side to, to, That's to go. Okay. All right. So how many of you are ready for a holiday in the Maldives? Uh, that's yeah. not very practical. <laughs> Campbell, sure, <laughs> sure you to sell your tickets. But, you know, this, this is, but, you know, it, you need to start small, right? It's just like with us, with this event, it's like, you know, 40, 40 people in this room. You know, we had to start small and we had to learn all the, the bubbles within the bubbles that we had to operate as well. So you have to, to start somewhere, otherwise you're not going to go anywhere. I think the key is this, whatever lessons we learn from this demonstrator, we will then apply to other green lanes with other countries. Okay. So if this works, then therefore a destination like Andrew uh, that operates in Bintan, for example, or a, a destination in Phuket and all that could become part of this, this test, right? Yeah, this isn't just about luxury travel. The only reason we're starting with Maldives is it felt like a great test case to prove a set of systems. Yeah. But immediately after that, we'd love to go to Bintan. I think, that, let's be clear too, a lot of the air seats that are flying internationally these days are either supported by cargo, by government underwrite, or by very limited business travel. Which is why you're seeing one, two, three times a week frequency instead of four, five times a day frequency. The, the mass market is critical to mm. accelerating and resuming mm. anywhere close to where we were. And so we need examples of opening up the mass market, the leisure market, um, to get that ball rolling. Yeah, and, and not only Singapore needs it desperately, you know, I mean, Phuket, Samui, um, Bintan, that's completely tourism mm -hmm. dependent, absolutely need it this winter. Yeah. Otherwise, it's going to be a disaster in those markets. So, you know, so amazing that you guys put this together. It must have taken, you know, uh, Chupin is a born diplomat, you see. So he's, uh, he's the one who's been <laughs> discussing with governments and, and being able to pull the private sector together, right? So anybody in this audience who would like to work on another green lane, you know, that can, we can start planning for it, please uh, come to see these guys here, uh, Chupin, Campbell, Hugh, and Ross. So thank you so much for putting in the work. You know, this, this, <laughs> this uh, panel, I mean, as short as it is, has taken a lot, of, uh, a lot of work to put together. You know, it started off with that sort of meeting with the Minister of Maldives on the Zoom call that we had. And then, you know, then we drilled it down. So thank you so much for putting together this. And really, uh, we need this. We wish you the best of luck, guys. We, we need to uh, cheer them on, right? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.